Of course, the radical Republicans were the most alarmed. Uh, some of them had actually welcomed Johnson's accession. Benjamin Wade of Ohio, who said, you know, that because Johnson had spoken so much of punishing traitors that many radicals thought he was really um, sympathetic, sympathetic to them, even though he had never said anything about black rights, which was, you know, a big issue for them. They liked his statements against treason, um, but within a month or two, they were very bitter. Thaddeus Stevens wrote to Sumner, I believe before Congress meets, Johnson will have so bedeviled matters as to make them incurable. Um, they've got to figure out a way of reversing this plan. So, all right, this brings us to these radical Republicans. We have talked about them a lot. They will play a major role in Reconstruction. Who are they? What were they? Now, one can go back, the older view of them putting aside just the notion they're just vindictive and they hate the South, in the 1920s, 30s, even 40s, the sort of Beardian view was dominant, that the radicals were the cutting edge, the agents of northern capitalist penetration of the South. As, Char as uh, Howard K. Beale, in a great book on this period, wrote, they were a minority um, who wanted to fasten upon the country an economic system that had failed to make headway against the combined South and West. Holding the South in military rule would enable them to do that, and then eventually giving blacks the right to vote would enable the Republican Party to rule the South and bring in capitalist development. In other words, the public issues they talked about, like black rights, were just a facade for their real uh, motives, which had to do with a high tariff, sound money, that is, you know, uh, coin as money, and um, etc. This is the Beardian view. You don't look at a politician's statements, you watch his feet, you know, you watch his economic self-interest. The problem with this view is that neither the radicals nor northern capitalists were united on any of these issues. Um, in fact, their divisions, this is not what made you a radical, what your position on the tariff was or on money. The tariff was a battleground within business and within the North. In fact, New England manufacturers actually didn't want a tariff anymore because uh, they, they were well set up. They didn't need protection from foreign competition. The real push for the tariff was from iron producers in Pennsylvania, but, um, the, but you know, there were a lot, the, the business, northern business was hardly, um, hardly united. The banks of Wall Street, New York City, were actually pro-Andrew Johnson. They, they gave Johnson a tremendous reception when he came uh, to, the North, to New York in 1866. Um, the radicals themselves were divided. Thaddeus Stevens, yes, he believed in a high tariff. Charles Sumner believed in a low tariff. Thaddeus Stevens believed in soft money. This is a big issue at the time, very murky, quite to understand. What to do with all those greenbacks? Remember, million, hundreds of millions of dollars of federal currency had been printed, legal tender, has to be accepted by anyone, during the Civil War. What to do about it? It had caused a lot of inflation. Many people said, no, we got to get rid of that stuff. We got to go back to specie payments, that is, gold and silver as the basis of, of currency. No more paper money that's legal tender. Let's retire the greenbacks. Take them out of circulation slowly until we get to a point where only, only money representing gold and silver is really circulating. That's what the bankers wanted. That's what many merchants wanted. On the other hand, there were many people who kind of liked the greenbacks. They liked inflation. Um, entrepreneurs, Stevens, he liked soft money. Why? Because the more money there is, uh, the easier it is to get credit, to invest. Many people said, just like today, you know, that's what the, the Federal Reserve has been printing money since 2008. Every day they just print it up and give it to banks. That's our economic policy nowadays. Give the banks as much money as they can and assume some of it will trickle down to the rest of us. But so people who were entrepreneurs starting up wanted, wanted soft money. They wanted the greenbacks to continue. In other words, control of the South was not based on those economic policies because there was no consensus within the Republican Party or among the radicals. That's not what made you a radical what your position on the tariff was or on uh, uh, soft money, hard money, um, et cetera, et cetera. Um, 
Business is divided. Much of it supported Andrew Johnson, Northern Business, because they wanted things to just get back to normal. Um, so what really, in 1865, what divides radical Republicans from others is indeed the issue of black suffrage. Earlier it had been emancipation and the early Civil War. Now the line of division is black suffrage in the South, black male suffrage, of course. Moderate Republicans, conservative Republicans are opposed to it or they just think it's too dangerous a political issue, but the radicals now are pushing this. Um, as their main, now it is dangerous politically. Henry Wilson, the radical senator from Massachusetts says, there is not today a square mile in the United States where the advocacy of the equal rights of the colored men has not been in the past and is not now unpopular. It's unpopular, the radicals don't care if it's unpopular or not. They are representing districts where it's not unpopular, but most Republicans are representing districts where you can't really advocate black suffrage. It's a dangerous thing. And you know, the elections are coming up in 1866. People don't want to go out on a limb on a policy which might not be successful. And indeed, several northern states had referendums in 1865, 66, 67, 68, on whether to amend their state constitutions to allow blacks to vote. The number of blacks in the north is minimal. This is a purely symbolic thing. Tiny. It's not going to affect the election, except maybe in some little local ward or something. And yet, almost every single northern state that voted on this turned it down. Connecticut, Wisconsin, Minnesota, Ohio, New York in 1867, Michigan. Only Iowa, Iowa, they called the, the most radical state, did change their constitution in order to, there weren't very many black people in Iowa, but after 1868, the Constitution of Iowa allowed blacks to vote. But this was not, so it wasn't a very popular position. Radicals didn't care. They're not, their job is not taking a, a popular position. It's taking an a ideological position and trying to push people toward it. Why did they want black suffrage? Well, you know, Thaddeus Stevens, who always said what he thought, which is an admirable thing, I guess, um, Stevens got up at the beginning of Congress and said, we got to give black men the right to vote. Why? Why do we got One, it is right. That's the number one thing. It is right. They deserve the right to vote, like any person in this country, many men. Two, it will, they are the, it will keep the rebels out of power in the South. This is the only way to prevent the ex-Confederates from controlling the South. There's not enough white unionists to do that. Number three, it will keep the Republican Party in power. That's partisan politics, right? And then Stephen stops, he says, I hear some demagogue on the other side saying, aha, he avows the party purpose. He Stephen says, I do, because I believe that the Democrats are all traitors <laughs> and that the Republican Party is the embodiment of what is good in this country. And uh, we must, you know, and moreover, without black suffrage, we cannot reconstruct the union properly. Now, in the Janap, there's this speech that he gave about reconst really reconstructing the society. Remember, Stevens wanted to redistribute the land in the South, really create a whole new uh, social order there. Um, now, Stevens is not the majority by any means. But the radical influence is greater than their numbers because in a time of crisis, they have a clear vision. Stevens has an explanation. It's an explanation that may appeal to a lot of people who don't even care that much about black rights. Keeping the rebels out of power, that's the language that many Northerners can, can um, understand. Georges Clemenceau, the French prime minister in World War I, in Reconstruction was a young reporter for a French newspaper in Washington. And his reports were later published and he called Stevens the, this of course is a French, the Robespierre, the Robespierre of the Second American Revolution. He understood, he, he, un, he saw, he knew what Stevens was. He was a radical trying to push things in a radical direction, to try to reconstruct the society, destroy the planter aristocracy, and give full security to African Americans as the main loyal element in the South. 
and that this would also ensure Republican Party control of the national government. 